Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Edward K. Y. Chen Distinguished Lecture. I'm Mo Bi Hong, Year One student of the Bachelor of Economics and Finance program. We are very delighted to have four Asian experts from Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, and Thailand to speak on the subject of democracy and economic development, the Asian experiences in general, and from their perspective, in particular, this evening. Before the lecture begins, may I first invite Dean Eric Chan, Cone Professor of the Faculty of Business and Economics, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Professor Chen, please. Distinguished speakers, Professor Chen, honorable guests, colleagues, fellow alumni, and the students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the 2014 lecture of the Edward K. Y. Chen Distinguished Lecture Series, organized by the School of Econ Finance of the Hong Kong U Faculty of Business and Economics. It's our honor to have together four experts at Hong Kong U to share their insights on democracy and economic development. As a tribute to Professor Edward Chen, this lecture series initiated by a group of his students who studied at HKU in the 1970s. Through a fund established in 2007, this lecture series honored Professor Chen's outstanding scholarship and his dedication to teaching excellence. It also demonstrated and reminds the younger generations of the ch important Chinese tradition of respecting one's teachers and the mentors. In Chinese, we say, Without such a great teacher as Professor Chen, there wouldn't be a group of supportive alumni who were inspired to contribute back to the society and their alma mater in such a meaningful way. I would like to take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Chen and his students who dedicate themselves to knowledge exchange and heritage. Without further ado, I will pass the stage to our honorary professor, Professor Fred Ma, to introduce the speakers and the topic of today's lecture. Professor Ma, please. Thank you, Thank you Professor Chen. May I now invite Professor Frederick Ma, honorary professor of the School of Economics and Finance, to introduce the guest speakers of tonight's lecture. Vice Chancellor, Dean, Professor Chen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and welcome to the 2014 Edward K. Y. Chen Distinguished Lecture. Before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I would like to give some of you, actually all of you, a bit of background of this lecture series as what Dean has just mentioned. The idea of establishing the lecture series was initiated by a group of former Hong Kong U students, including myself, of Professor Chen in early 1970s, some 40 years ago. It represents a tribute to our honored teacher, and it also aspires to demonstrate the fine traditions of great respect and appreciation for teachers and mentors to generations to come, something I personally felt is much needed in Hong Kong today. Now back to our lecture topic today, democracy and economic development, the Asian experiences. One of the most influential and most respected politicians in Asia, if not the world, Lee Kuan Yew, said the following right here in Luke Yao Ho, back in 1997, together with Governor Patton, and I quote him, I have never believed that democracy brings progress. I know it to have brought regression, unquote. 
To examine the relationship between democracy and economic development, we are honored to have four distinguished academia and experts from Thailand, Taiwan, Singapore, and Korea to share their experiences. If I read out their full resume, it will take at least half an hour. So let me briefly introduce them. I will introduce them according to their speaking sequence. Professor Yonghan Zhu, Zhu Wanhon Gao Sao, is Professor of Political Science at National Taiwan University and Distinguished Research Fellow of Institute of Political Science at Academia Sinica. Professor Zhu specializes in the politics of Greater China, Eastern Asian political economy, and democratization. He served as director of programs of the Institute for National Policy Research, Taiwan's leading independent think tank from 1989 to 1999, and former president of Chinese Association of Political Science, Taipei, between 2002 and 2004. He has been the coordinator of Asian Barometer Survey, a regional network of survey on democracy, governance, and development covering more than 16 Asian economies. Dr. So Jiu Young is a professor of green growth and sustainable development at the Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management in Seoul and director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network Korea chapter. He has worked on various de developmental and international challenges of Korea as a government economist since the late 1970s, including Korea's unilateral trade liberalization, President Kim Yong sams financial transparency reform, and served as president of the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy, Korea's ambassador to OECD, and president of the National Strategy Institute, an independent Korea think, think tank. His Excellency Dr. Laurent Chai is Minister of Energy and former Minister of Commerce and Senator of Thailand, with a long record of public services and extensive experiences in private sector. In the past, Dr. Laurent Chai acted as an advisor to several Thai prime minister and governments. He retired as chairman of Exim Bank of Thailand in 2010, and also served as a director of Securities and Futures Commission, National Economic and Social Development Board, and an advisor to the Board of Investment. Dr. Laurent Chai is a founding member and director of Thailand Development Research Institute. The final speaker today will be Professor Simon Tay, Dai Seung Ji Gao Sao is a public intellectual as well as a private advisor to major corporations and policy makers. He is chairman of the Singapore Institute of International Affairs, the country's oldest think tank and founding member of the ASEAN network of think tanks. He is concurrently associate professor teaching international law at the National University of Singapore and author of the well-received book on Asian regionalism and the role of America Asia alone. Professor Tay is also a senior consultant at Warm Partnership, a leading Asian law firm. Ladies and gentlemen, with four distinguished speakers going to speak to us on this very important subject, I will now invite Professor Chu to start his presentation. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes and then followed by a 30-minute panel discussion and then followed by a 20-minute question and answer session from the floor. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Edward Chan, and colleagues and friends. Uh, I feel truly honored and privileged to speak uh, this very, very uh, di distinguished panel in front of such a, uh, uh, 
distinguished uh, gathering. Um, I have known Prof. Edward Chen for decades, uh, although I look very young. Um, and I haven't seen him for a while. Uh, and this afternoon, uh, when I saw him, the first thing I said to him that I wish I had students like yours. Uh, I'm giving a, actually every speaker here is given a huge task. Uh, try to use 10 minutes uh, to cover such a huge and broad topic. Usually I would spend the whole semester, you know, the, uh, uh, on this uh, huge subject. But nevertheless, you know, I'll try my best at the risk of oversimplification uh, simplification, uh, to offer you a few uh, uh, insights uh, based on the latest uh, research uh, from the political science community. Uh, so here are the, uh, the, the, the key message I want to convey uh, and probably try to provoke some dialogue and debate here. First of all, the relationship between democracy and economic development is a complex one and defies simple generalization. Okay, no, professor's job is to make things more problematic, okay. <laughs> we don't give, you know, so-called correct answer. Secondly, uh, economic development facilitates democracy, uh, democratic development, uh, while other things being equal. However, more and more empirical analysis point out that uh, there are many other important structural conditions, which are oftentimes more important uh, than just the level of economic development usually measured by uh, per capita GDP. Third point is that um, quality of a government, or you might use a different expression, quality of governance, uh, instead of democracy, actually holds the key to successful economic development. And this point has been confirmed and reconfirmed by many political scientists you know, in the latest literature. Uh, my last point is about you know, how we uh, place uh, East Asian uh, experience in the, this larger context. I will argue that uh, our experience, the regional experience are uh, quite perplexing and pose many puzzles to students of uh, democratization. Well, let me come to the first side of the equation, okay? Uh, whether, uh, that is, you know, whether economic development is a key determinant of democracy. Well, you know, uh, we have a standard view on this question. Uh, and especially, you know, if we trace it back to uh, the modernization theory, uh, and here that, you know, exemplified by the work of Martin Lipset. Um, the, the gist of this theory, you know, is that, you know, modernization uh, in the long run is going to be like a coherent process. So eventually, um, the political institution uh, will, you know, uh, become uh, compatible with the social economic structural condition. So can with modernization, you know, you have widespread education, you have the emergence of the middle class, um, then eventually, you know, they would demand a wider avenue for political partici partici uh, participa uh, participation and also demand greater uh, popular accountability, uh, better rule of law, and same time, uh, the middle class, we, you know, we serve as kind of uh, the pillar for a stable democracy and avoiding uh, the pro-right clash between the working class and the, 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 uh, the capitalist class. So this is, you know, uh, the standard view. However, this standard view, I think, over the last uh, 15 years has been qualified and qualified, uh, especially with uh, more and more uh, empirical analysis, which has been very systematic, uh, and they try to uh, use very sophisticated technology to uh, examine the human history uh, over more than 200 years, uh, and try to summar summarize, you know, what uh, the big database can, you know, uh, suggest us. And uh, like this, you know, monumental uh, publication by uh, H. Mugru and Robertson. Uh, published in, uh, in 2005, and they identify actually, um, you know, what determine whether a society uh, might become democratic. Uh, it depends on six uh, uh, factors, you know, strengths of civil socii uh, society, the nature of the political and economic crisis at juncture of the political opening, 
uh, the level of uh, 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 wealth inequality, um, and also uh, what kind of a political institution the society inherited, uh, and, and the nature of the existing uh, economic institution, and, and finally, you know, how th this given society is you know, uh, integ integrated into the global economy. And so among these five, uh, actually six sexual conditions, economic development has something to do with you know, a few of them, but not all of them. Uh, in addition, I think uh, another important uh, work you know, uh, done by uh, Charles uh, uh, Boisha, you know, also pointed out that actually uh, where the country locates itself in the international system, in the regional uh, order, is also very, very important. Uh, if a country belongs to a regional uh, alliance, a regional order, with the hegemon being the democratic, then it might create a more conducive environment for its ally to become democratic. On the other hand, if you are securely uh, dependent on uh, a hegemon, which is not a democratic system, then uh, the, the probability become much lower. So this is, a, as I said, you know, so the relationship between the economic development and uh, 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 being democratic, it's actually quite uh, complex, and there are many other structural conditions other than uh, economic development. And now we can you know, bring the East Asia into perspective. You know, economic speaking, East Asia has been the most dyna dynamic region in the world, but in terms of political development, however, East Asia for the last, I would say, 35 years has defied the global trend of what we call the third wave democratization. You know, this is a concept coined by uh, Sam Huntington. Um, out of the 18 uh, sovereign state and autonomous territory in the region, only six, uh, you know, in the recent past, have been classified by Freedom House as free, which means you know they have a functional liberal uh, democracy. Actually, among the six, uh, two of them for a long, long time have been, you know, actually uh, ranked by you know the Freedom House as partially free, not totally free. Okay. Um, at the same time, the region has been the cradle of developmental uh, uh, authoritarianism. So East Asia, in many ways, you know, actually defies this global trend. Um, and so, you know, so this is a very, not a very you know, conclusive story you know, about the you know, relationship between modernization and democratic uh, development, in, at least in the case of East Asia. Now, I have only two minutes. Let me say a few words about, you know, is democracy a key determinant of economic development? I would say it's also very debatable. Uh, although you know, some author, you know, they often time uh, point out that democracy might facilitate and might be actually you know, a very important prerequisite. But uh, more recently, I think the emerging consensus uh, has been given by people like uh, Bo Rothstein and Pippa North. Uh, they use you know, a large data set to suggest that quality of a government uh, you know, actually is more important or more uh, decisive in shaping a, a society, social economic future, than just being democratic. Uh, actually, my good friend Pippa Norris, you know, uh, in her most recent work, suggests that you know, being a liberal democracy alone is not enough to create a human well-being. If state lack the capacity to implement, implement policy, and I would argue that actually East Asia, overall speaking, if especially we covered you know the entire six years after World War II, provide the most compelling case that in Dormant of modern functional law uh, binding state is a prerequisite to a successful economic development. And uh, in actually, in quite a few cases, I will argue that uh, the East Asian economy that has successfully climbed up the ladder of industrial upgrading were endowed with orientation and capability of developmental state. I will stop right here. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ji, for enhancing our understanding on the topic and on, the, on this topic. May I now invite our professor from Korea, Dr. Sugil Yang, to present his view to us. Dr. Yang, please. Right. Uh, good evening, Professor uh, Chen. Uh, uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored to have been invited to address this distinguished audience this evening. Professor Ed Chen, Dr. Narong Chai, 
who is one of the speakers uh, tonight, and I would often meet at the same conference back in the early 1980s, uh, held to discuss whether and how the East Asian economies such as South Korea, Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei, Singapore, Thailand, and so on could continue economic development. We are more or less in the same company again this time in order to uh, look back on the development experiences of our economies since then and see what the role of political development has been in that perspective. Uh, many of us uh, economists in those days uh, seemed to think that the so-called uh, de developmental state or authoritarian capitalism uh, was necessary and good for economic development, and even that uh, in developing countries, uh, democracy uh, was likely to hurt economic development. Since then, and in the decade of the 1990s in particular, the Asian value explanation or the Confucian capitalism theory of East Asia's economic success emerged from this line of thinking. I think that uh, that theory has been uh, losing supporters in more recent years. However, the topic of today's discussions, democracy and economic development, Asian experiences, seems to rekindle the issue. The question raised by the topic is whether democracy helps or hurts economic development. I have been invited here tonight because the organizers apparently thought that Korea's modern development experiences may shed light on this question. I think that, in fact, they do, so I will uh, now explain. The uh, Republic of Korea started out as a democratic country when it was first founded in 1948, but until the end of the 1950s, Korea's new democracy was weak, corrupt, and it's unsustainable. And even allowing for the disruption caused by the three-year Korean War in the early 50s, Korea's economic performance remained weak and the country remained caught in the vicious cycle of political instabilities and widespread unemployment, poverty, and starvation under President Seung Man Rhee and his successor, Prime Minister John M. Chung. Uh, both leaders demonstrated uh, a lack of effective leadership in tackling uh, economic problems as well as continuing political instability. I recall that around the end of the 1950s, a, the Times, a British uh, uh, a daily, said in its e editorial something like this, we may rather hope to see roses bloom out of a waste basket than to see democracy bloom in South Korea. This early experience of Korea shows that democracy is likely to hurt economic development in an extremely poor country in the absence of inspired and effective uh, leadership. There was a vicious cycle operating between malfunctioning democracy and extreme poverty. This served to bring in General Park Chung-hee to launch Korea's modern economic development. Korea launched rather spectacular economic development under the strong authoritarian leadership of President Park Chung-hee, who toppled the existing weak democratic government with a military coup in 1961 and was subsequently elected as president. He directed Korea's development drive for 18 years until late 1979 when he met tragic death by assassination. Park Chung-hee was succeeded by General Chun doo hwan who assumed the power with a coup in the depth of political confusion following the death of President Park and installed himself as president in 1980. He also ruled as an authoritarian uh, president for seven years until early 1988. He then surrendered to people's escalating or irrepressible uh, popular demand for democratization in 1987 by letting his hand-picked presidential candidate No Teu issue a declaration of democratization on June 29, in which the government promised to hold the presidential election at the end of the year by universal suffrage instead of the indirect election which had been planned. Rather ironically, but because of the failure of the two major opposition candidates at the time to join hands, Roteu won the election under popular voting, and when in office, President Roe pushed various reforms for democratization with speed 
as he had promised, opening a new era of full-fledged democracy. So uh, roses have finally have begun to bloom out of the Korean whatever. Uh, now, this, uh, the slide here uh, shows that Korea's economic development uh, performance as measured by economic uh, growth uh, since the uh, Park chung coup, and remarkably, uh, it shows that uh, Korea continued rather rapid economic development throughout the whole period, whether under authoritarian governments or uh, after restoration of democracy in 1987. Except during the Asian financial crisis uh, in 1990s and the global financial crisis in late Notice. Now here I have uh, listed uh, uh, the uh, right uh, here. Let me review the economic development performance by regime. Park Chung Hee regime began with income less than 100 U.S. dollars, but ended with the income of 1,900 U.S. dollars in '79. The annual GDP growth rate during this period was 80% or so. The income level had risen to 4,800 US dollars under the authoritarian Chun Doo Hwan government by its expiry in 1988. Korea's income level had risen to exceed 13,000 US dollars in 1996, which was the year of Korea's accession to the OECD, uh, uh, but only to be brought back down to uh, 8,100 US dollars by 1998 under the Asian financial crisis. And in the post-Asian financial crisis period, a prior crisis level of uh, about 13,000 US dollars was restored by 2020 and subsequently income has kept uh, rising and had reached uh, $26,000 uh, last year. Now, Park Chung hee was an Uh, enlightened and determined and effective leader with modern management training from his military background, strong on details and implementation, and he justified his so-called military revolution with commitment to deliver uh, the nation from poverty and starvation. He remained free of corruption and was successful in winning abroad public support, although students' protests persisted. And President Park delivered uh, on his commitment by uh, ch choosing a broadly right mix of economic strategies and policies as shown in, uh, this, uh, uh, in, in the previous slide. Now, President Chun Doo-hwan inherited an economy in a serious crisis for many reasons, uh, for domestic and international uh, re reasons, and Chun pushed reforms for fundamental restructuring of the economy which had been come into a serious crisis, structural crisis, and he did so to relaunch economic development. And again, President Chun also uh, uh, pursued a mix of policies uh, which were fitting to the economic uh, circumstances of the day as uh, shown uh, on this uh, slide. And through these reforms, the growth dynamism remained subdued in the early 1980s, but they made Korea ready to take advantage of three helpful international developments uh, called three laws, and, uh, uh, and uh, by the uh, mid-1980s, uh, Korea was able uh, to relaunch a second takeoff by taking advantage of those favorable international conditions uh, to high uh, growth path into the 1990s. And uh, uh, so uh, there were export boomed, uh, industries relaunched rapid export-led growth, uh, the chronic current account deficits uh, shifted to uh, surpluses, and uh, growth was very high. Now, there were two secrets to President Chun's economic policy success. First, uh, he recruited and deployed able and market-oriented economic technocrats and entrust entrusted economic policies entirely in their hands. And second, he used his imperial presidency to help these technocrats overcome resistance to those reforms. Now, uh, I uh, have to, uh, wanted to explain how, uh, despite 
so such highly successful economic uh, development outcome, how the authoritarian governments came to an end. Uh, I will uh, skip the detailed explanations, but I just want to say that they became the uh, victim of their own success as people's income rose, uh, their uh, uh, demand for uh, freedoms uh, increased as well, uh, and therefore uh, th those authoritarian presidents had to uh, 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 f found it difficult to cope with this irrepressible uh, demand for uh, democratization. So in the end, uh, uh, the second authoritarian leader, uh, President Chun, uh, had to, uh, to uh, accommodate the people's request for democratization. So as a result, uh, the, the, uh, in 1987, uh, those uh, military uh, leaders, form of li military leaders, uh, issued this declaration of a democracy, a promising holding of uh, direct election or uni universal suffrage for presidential election, among other things. And this was the beginning of a new democracy in uh, Korea. Now, the moral of this analysis is that however well intended or benevolent an authoritarian development state is, there seems to be an inbuilt self-destruction mechanism embedded in it. In fact, the more successful uh, an authoritarian state is in delivering economic development, it may be the less likely to be self-sustaining. So thus, uh, an authoritarian government even when highly successful is not sustainable, it is bound to transition to a democratic government. And this seems to be an entirely logical outcome of successful development. And after all, the ultimate objective of economic objective is to improve people's well-being, and this consists in increasing satisfaction of people's wants, including wants for more freedom, and with increasing income, people's want or demand for political freedom, that is democracy, is bound to uh, intensify proportionately more uh, rapidly. So this is to say that democratization itself should be considered a fruit of success of economic development. And furthermore, beyond a certain level of income, democracy becomes a necessary condition, uh, though not necessarily a sufficient one for continued economic development. And this, at least, was a Korean experience. I'm only half through with my present <laughs> preparation, but I think I owe it to the organizers to stop it here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for your inspiring views on the Korea's experiences. We would like to invite our guest speaker from Thailand, Dr. Naran Chai, to present his view to us. Dr. Naran Chai, please. Uh, 10 minutes, five points. One point, two minutes each. So please, the timekeeper, monitor. <laughs> you look at the graph, it tells the whole story about democracy in Thailand. The land of smile, the land of cool data. Uh, you notice? Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> Everywhere. So democracy as defined, defined as government by representation is still in transition in Thailand. Now into year 82, already gone 82 years, into the year 82. When you talk about democracy by representation, no taxation without representation, no legislation without representation, we are still trying. If you take the average, we have one coup in 16 years. So people argue whether a coup d'etat is a cause or consequence of democracy failure. The democracy advocate will say, because of coup d'etat, democracy fail. The coup advocate will say, because of democracy, we need to have coup d'etat. You make your own choice. That's point number one. Point number two, Thailand has had and has tried all kinds of governments. Government by election, government by selection, 
government by election plus election. It is called hybrid. At the moment, we have government by selection. And I am a member of that government by selection. <laughs> and uh, a few years ago, I was in the government. That was 1976-77. You saw the graph. You know, that's when the economy collapsed. I was there. <laughs> <laughs> that was government by election. But I was elected. I was not a representative. So you cannot blame democracy on me. <laughs> We're still trying to find the most workable form of government up to today. 31st of October 2014. And this present government, we have set up again what we call National Reform Council. And they are to come up with a form of government workable for Thailand. I'm sure they will have a very hard time. And whatever they come up with, I am sure the military will not follow. <laughs> Point number three. Point number three. Different form of government have different achievements. I have been with government for 40 years in one way or another started from 1974 because I took part in the dem demonstration occupying Bangkok. <laughs> and I looked at Hong Kong today, maybe they have another 82 years or 40 years to, <laughs> to demand what they would like to have. That's what I did. And we succeeded. The military government gave in we selected a prime minister, and as a reward, I was appointed advisor to the prime minister. That was the beginning of my economic development, public policy career. So based on what I have been involved with over the last 40 years, I've come to this conclusion. Uh, government by selection or hybrid, it's very popular now you have this word hybrid, achieve better economic reform or economic restructuring. I could refer to the adoption of the market economy in 1960, that was before my time. Industrialization of the 1980s, that was during my time. From 1980 to 1988, we had real industrialization. And I was a key person in that process because that government allowed us to do the work. Globalization from 1990, again I was in the government as representative of the prime minister. That's when we had AFTA, ASEAN Free Trade Area. That's when we opened up our financial sector. And the question mark we have at the moment is that now we are into the process of digitalization. But we started that in the year about 2002, 2003. But for political problems that we have had over these years, digitalization hasn't gone very far. But again, when we talk about uh, other aspects of national development, government by election more responsive to political and social changes. I could refer to the year 1975-1976 in the graph. Uh, during that time, we had a representative government when the Vietnam War ended we moved very quickly to normalize relationship with China. That was the end of the beginning of the, the end of the Cold War. And when the Cold War ended in 1989, 1991, we moved very quickly to make friends with Indochina. This is how Thailand operates, you know? We choose friends very carefully, depending on which side is going to win the war. <laughs> and with representative government, it seemed to work very fast in that sense. Uh, but recently, this representative government, by responding so quickly to social change, social demand, they have introduced populism to the extreme. Populism to the extreme in order for them to have control of parliament. 
And that was the beginning of the problem that we have for the last several years. Now, point number four, almost five points. Governance is more important than government. I think Prime Minister India said that. I copy his phrase. Government with good governance, irrespective of how it comes into power, perform better, based on 40 years of my experience in the government in Thailand. So the rule of law is more important. According to a survey in Hong Kong yesterday, they say the same thing. They copy my speech. <laughs> it's, I think Simon Tay also had a publication about enemy within. He talked about corruption. He talked about the lack of rule of law. It's the same. That's here he comes, you see. I'll finish before him. <laughs> so basically, I think having been with government over these years, Governance is much more important than how government is selected or elected. And we cannot just simply hope or expect that by having election, by having representative government, we can have good government. Now, my last point, point number five, point number five, the West, the West. The West meaning the U.S., meaning European, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, they will support or condemn or no action to non-representative government depending upon their global strategic interests. I remember very well when we had the coup d'etat in 1957, they were behind it. Even the political change in Indonesia in 1966-67, the U.S. was behind it. And uh, when we started this process of market economy from 1960 onwards, the US, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, everybody was behind it. In fact, I received scholarship to go to all these countries because they were giving scholarship to a country that came into being having government from coup d'etat. But last time, last time, last time, this last May, they condemn us. Now, as minister, I cannot have official visit to all these countries. <laughs> I can visit, you know, for sightseeing, but not official visit. They do not recognize us. But to me, I think we should not pay too much attention. I am 70 years old now, you know, so I come to that conclusion. I told them that I have lived for so long with this burden of ideology of democracy. I have lived for so long with the burden of ideology of democracy. Without, without, but I have had, I say without all, I have, I have not had the luxury of choices over this year. So any government I selected was bad. So what do I do? As a technocrat, I serve any government whether they come from election, selection, hybrid, as long as I can do something useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor, for your insight and views on the Thailand's experiences. We would like to invite our guest speaker from Singapore, Professor Simon Tay, to present his views on the topic. Professor Tay, please. Mr. Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Chen, thank you for inviting me. In my 10 minutes, I have to try to cover three ASEAN countries, uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, and my own country, Singapore. So the best I start with a joke. Uh, a very powerful but cruel genie doesn't know much about democracy in ASEAN. So he says, tell me something true about yourself, and you get lots of rewards. But if it's false, I will destroy you immediately and utterly. So the Indonesian says, Genie, I think I'm the most established democracy in ASEAN. Boom! <laughs> but whoa, all these problems happen and Indonesia cannot run anymore. Democratic, but lack of actual governance. The Myanmar then stands up and says, Genie, I think I'm the most promising democracy in ASEAN. Boom! 
Aung San Suu Kyi cannot run for the next general elections. Uh, things start to fall apart. And again, it's destruction. And there's silence among the ASEAN members until little Singapore stands up and says, Genie, I think, boom, destroy. <laughs> so my point is that, I think if there is a point to this joke, it is that we should really be humble about looking at democracy and its connections especially to democratic uh, economic development. We have been fooled many times. In my own lifetime, uh, we have seen the Asian crisis and coming out of it. We expected Thailand to democratize and do well. We expected Indonesia to be really have much more problems. And today, popular opinion is almost the reverse. But honestly, we are not at the end of the story. We are probably somewhere in the middle. Looking across our region, therefore, the first thing to me is that we have come to recognize democracy as a very important value, but one that's more complicated. In the ASEAN Charter, we talk not only about democracy and human rights, but about good governance. And I think in a sense, this charter echoes a number of the things the other speakers have talked about, the quality of governance. The second thing is that in ASEAN, as a group of 10 countries from the almost absolute monarchy of uh, Brunei, not, not Thailand, Brunei, to Indonesia and with Laos and Vietnam somewhere in between, we've come to recognize that there is a need to accept plurality and to, as Nong Chai says, give up a strong ideology of democracy even as we hold true to the direction of democracy. And so the progressive realization of democracy, human rights, and good governance remains our goal, though we will accept and have to accept there will be ups and downs, reversals on the way. No ASEAN government has, unlike the West, condemned our Thai friends. In fact, we've actually tried to understand these challenges very much as people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. Apparently, I have a PowerPoint, even I have no power and no point. So <laughs> let me move on. In terms of looking at the uh, three countries uh, rapidly, uh, Indonesia, Myanmar, and my own Singapore, uh, Kun Narangcha has already talked about Thailand. I wish to actually first start off with Professor Chen. In his quick survey of the literature, it's very clear these relationships are very complex. I will have to simplify. First, I think that the clear experience of these countries is that there is no single model nor one-way direction. Some people think that democracy will bring economic development, and that's often not true. It depends on the quality of the governance. Often, it leads to a lot of freedom by indecision or popularist policies which go wrong. The reverse idea is that middle class will kind of automatically deliver uh, democracy. And again, this may not be true because often the middle class is precisely conservative. There is an elite that wishes to keep power to itself. And the third, I think, false, very easy statement is that growth and democracy is kind of a trade-off. And sometimes my country is used as an example of this, sometimes even called the Lee Kuan Yew hypothesis though I don't think he ever did a PhD, so he didn't have to do a hypothesis. Clearly, our own experience is that this is not true. Constantly, in Singapore example, we've had elections, we've tried to listen to people, and even if not a civil or liberal democracy in the Western sense, democracy has always been in the frame, even as we've tried to progress the economy. So looking at these three countries today, what do we see? Indonesia clearly has consolidated a democratic election process. And this is a remarkable, remarkable, remarkable uh, uh, change. The Indonesia that suffered the crisis went through 10 plus years of complete turmoil. It is only in the last presidency of SBY and now looking forward, Jokowi. But the politics is incredibly uh, intense. And more than that, the quality and capacity of the government to deliver, not just speeches and the right policies, but to implement is seriously still in question. I remain optimistic, but Jokowi has been a person who has delivered almost every city he's run, but Indonesia will be a challenge. Quickly on to Myanmar. Here, I think many people have been pleasantly surprised by the progressive steps, the dramatic opening of the country. But let's face it, many more steps to go. The last time they had an election, they called it a general election. 
but frankly, it was more an election to elect the generals. <laughs> and even today, while Aung San Suu Kyi is clearly the most popular person in the country, the constitution at the moment clearly forbids her to run, even to run for the, for the government. And honestly, if you speak to a broad cross-section of the people, whether the ruling elites or even people in the street, business people, normal people, not that business people are normal people, they have come to a, a very strange ambivalent conundrum. They respect her standing, respect her popularity, but they have real misgivings about her capacity to deliver governance. So I think it explains why survey after survey now in Myanmar is showing that present president, former General Tian Xian, formerly blacklisted by America, is actually becoming the most popular choice to be the next president. Not that there will be a movie made about him, unlike Aung San Suu Kyi. He's not as popular as a person, but he has become the choice about governance. If I look at my own country, I would say that what we have seen is that little uh, uh, sign there. We have started to actually see the start of a more loud democracy by Singapore standards. Questions of inequality, questions of uh, too many foreigners in our country have taken people not into the street, but into a particular place we call Hong Lim, not Hong Kong, Hong Lim Park, where we allow uh, free speech and demonstrations. And I have three minutes left. So in this sense, what I see in Singapore is a kind of changing social compact. And one of the, the incredible parts for the ruling elite is to understand that the delivery of the purely economic goods you see there in the Marina Bay with its casino, that kind of economic development is now taken for granted by the election, by the, the, the population. This is not enough. This picture of Lee Kuan Yew is actually, I think, an interesting picture because some people feel that Singapore fought for independence. Yes, it's true that as part of the post-World War II, we were keen to, keen to be separated from the British Empire. However, Lee Kuan Yew's first campaign actually was for the battle for merger with Malaysia to help form Malaysia as a larger economic entity that would help the small city-state of Singapore. And his tears were when we were forcibly ejected from Malaysia. And I think this is an important trade-off between this idea of independence and your being in your own democracy and the need to actually have a hinterland. Of course, it has helped us that in the years since then, globalization has opened up vaster hinterlands so we can connect to ASEAN and the world. But it bears remembering that this was not the original idea of Lee Kuan Yew and Singapore. Uh, these are some images now of Singapore's much more modest uh, protests uh, on Hong Lim, not Hong Kong Park. And these are very sentiments that I think a lot of us are experiencing because of global influences. The media, the sense of occupy Wall Street, occupy this, occupy that, is none of us are immune to it. But we will all react different to it depending, not just on our ideology of what democracy is, but our experience and trust of our government. Not just the economic goods, but keeping people in the frame. These 3,000 plus people have actually lost faith in the PAP. The last election has seen the PAP fall to record lows in votes, but their record lows is like 40% vote against them. Uh, globally, they are still quite significantly in charge. I don't think there is an end to this conversation about democracy in relationship to economic development. I think unless we can deliver social equity together with this sense of participation, there will always be challenges for all societies. I look forward to the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Che. After hearing the insightful views from our guest speaker, it's time for a more interactive exchange in the format of a panel discussions among our guest speakers. We are very happy to have invited Professor Frederick Ma to be our moderator of our panel discussions. May we invite Professor Ma, Dr. Naran Chai, Dr. Yang, and Professor Chu to come on stage. Without further ado, I will hand over the stage to Professor Ma for panel discussion. Professor Ma, please. Thank you for sharing their, their uh, views on democracy 
and economic development. Um, what I'm going to do is to ask a uh, few questions. Uh, by the way, this is the only forum that I've ever attended that is on time. Uh, mo most of the forums are uh, way over time, but uh, thank you for, for your understanding, the four speakers. Um, maybe I'll ask Professor Ju first, because you were the first speaker. Um, actually, you skipped the slide on comparing China and India because of lack of time. But uh, actually, in your presentation, you compare China and India, uh, both members of BRIC, and from the comparison, you know, can we draw the conclusion that quality of government instead of democracy holds the key to successful economic development because India is not doing as well as China, although India is known to have so-called democracy. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the chance to uh, go back to this very important uh, slide that I skipped you know, under the time pressure. Um, for uh, the last 10 years, uh, I think India and China comparison has been very, very popular and salient uh, among the political economists. Because the two largest, you know, the most populated you know, emerging economy in the world, they started off uh, in 1950 and 60, almost at the same low level, uh, especially in terms of uh, per capita income. It's uh, below 200 uh, uh, US dollar uh, per capita. And uh, you know, if, if you, you know, look back, and then over the last you know, 65 years, uh, China overtook India in every, uh, on every key indicator in terms of social economic development. Um, uh, uh, you know, not to mention, you know, we, we know, you know China nowadays is much more prosperous, you know, well off than uh, India. But also in terms of human development index, uh, life expectancy, uh, illiteracy rate, uh, you know, infant mortality rate, nutrition, everything. Uh, it have you know, make uh, probably much. I would say India also have make also you know considerable Im improvement over the last 20 years. But overall speaking, China you know uh, has been able to deliver you know much more impressively. So so then people have to ask you know that India has been a democratic you know the country for a long, long time. Although there are some you know episode where you know democracy run uh, into some difficulty, but by and large, for the last, you know, since I I independent is by and large, you know, constitute, constitute democracy. But I use that only try to, uh, you know, emphasize a point that being a democratic is not enough. It's not enough. And oftentimes if we, you know, we say, well, once you become democratic, then every, all the good thing will come all together. I, I'm, I have to say as a cool headed political scientist, you know, I would say this is the, most misleading generalization you can have, okay? Uh, actually, a state building is a much daunting challenge than democracy building. Uh, and this is actually the most important uh, task for all the country uh, facing today. If you read uh, the, uh, the book by Francis Fukuyama, you know, one of my good friends, uh, you know, in his most latest work, you know, he go back to the fundamental point about state building. Uh, rather than, you know, the, uh, you know he, he's, he no longer, he probably he had regretted that, you know, he published the book 20 years ago, you know, uh, in that kind of triumphalism, you know, liberal democracy and then the end of the history. Okay. It's not, no longer his main point. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Ranchai has a can I, can I some comment? comment. India and China, I, I look at it differently. You know. I think the, because of cultural reason, India is more suitable for democracy than China. Reason because Indian, they like to argue a lot. <laughs> it's the Professor Amartya Sen you know, has a book called Argumentative Indian. And these have gone back thousands of years. If you read the, uh, the epic story Mahaparata, before the two sides fight it, uh, fought, before they fought against each other, they argue first. Why do we fight? 
And after argument, they don't feel anything about it. Unlike the Chinese. The Chinese, they have this social conformity. They don't argue very much. They like to work rather than argue. So I think looking at these two cultures, you know, uh, you have to have an argumentative culture to have democracy. Uh, China does not have that. And I don't think China is suitable for democracy. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting point, Dr. Ron Chai. Dr. Yang, are the Koreans like to argue? Uh, love to argue? I think uh, implicitly he was referring to the role of the Confucian culture which pervades among the Chinese, uh, which makes uh, people uh, you know, uh, try to uh, cooperate and respect authority and leadership. And I think uh, we Koreans share a lot of that Confucianism as well. Actually, the question I want to ask uh, Dr. Yang, which is uh, um, about uh, democracy and uh, the point you made in the power presentation, but you have to skip due to time uh, pressure, is you made the point that under the democratic government, the economic development was no longer the primary objective of the government. Instead, social equity has become more important uh, can you explain that point? I think I should. Uh, I was speaking um, uh, on the basis of the experiences that you know, Korea has had at around the time of uh, democratization uh, in the uh, late 1980s. Uh, when income is very low, uh, people are basically and primarily concerned about earning bread. They are hungry. So they don't care much for or about other things. But as income level, so they don't care about democracy, in fact, much. But uh, as income level rises, uh, you now realize that uh, you, know, you don't live by uh, bread alone. You tend to uh, you begin to care for increasing number of things, and you want to uh, have more of those other things as well, and that includes political freedom and freedom of speech, a freedom to express one's own interest and values, uh, and you want to uh, take part in the society's decision-making process in order to promote your own and safeguard your interest and in, and values. Uh, so, uh, the now, so uh, as income level rises, uh, you know, at some point everybody begins to do that, uh, and in order to uh, 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 now, if you are not given that opportunity to express yourself uh, and participate in decision making you will not be cooperative socially. As a result, uh, lack of democracy uh, leads to the breakdown of social cooperation or social uh, contract for uh, cooperation. So as income level rises uh, to a high, lev high enough level, and I think it happened in the case of Korea at around the level of income of uh, 5,000 US dollars or so, this is what we reached uh, toward the uh, late uh, 19. Uh, 80s, uh, so uh, without democracy, uh, we, without introducing democracy, uh, we could not secure social cooperation for growth, and therefore uh, this in democracy had to be introduced. Now that the democracy has been introduced, now everybody now has a say, uh, wants to say something about his or her uh, values and interests, and everybody does that. So there arises conflicts of interests and, and, and contradictions among them. And so uh, you have to sort of uh, compromise and, and integrate into the uh, national or societal uh, decision making. And in that process, what counts the most or very important is social equity, the consideration of social equities. Uh, so uh, when the democracy has to address this issue of social equities, uh, redistribution and so on, then that's about social development. So social development becomes very important and without seeking social development, 
the cooperation for economic development breaks down, so there is this uh, circular uh, uh, causation. Uh, so, uh, so uh, and then, uh, and that happened in Korea, which is that when we have introduced a new democracy, everybody has begun to say something in, in defense of his or her own interest, uh, and so uh, social development became the highest priority for the government. So that the government had to leave the economy uh, and economic policies largely in the hands of the market and concentrate on social development. And by promoting social development, and through that, the government wanted to co uh, promote cooperation for economic development. So there is this sort of uh, uh, you know, virtuous cycle. And if it doesn't work very well, it becomes a vicious cycle, of course. Would any of the speakers would like to make comments on uh, Dr. Yang's point? No? Okay. I have a question for uh, Dr. Ron Chai. Um, this is uh, kind of related to Hong Kong. Uh, and I'd like to hear your experience. Our chief executive was recently quoted by New York Times that the chief executive's position must be screened by a broadly representative nominating committee because this would insulate candidates from popular pressure to create a welfare state. Uh, Thailand's Thaksin and Yingluck administrations were often mentioned by media to have bought votes from farmers by treating them favorably. Isn't this the negative side effect of democracy? Can you share your experience in this regard with the Hong Kong audience? Yes. The as I understand, your chief minister, he is government by selection. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> in, my, in my definition, in my definition. Depends on your definition. <laughs> he's not government by, by it. Or maybe he's a hybrid, I'm not sure. <laughs> but definitely not, not by election. <laughs> uh, yes, the, in, the, in my country, what was sad was that um, when we allow um, representative government to have full control, we actually we made that decision in 1997, and we set up a system to counterbalance a representative government with full control. Uh, but the, when we had the representative government, particularly this, this gentleman, Mr. Thaksin, who has taken up uh, Hong Kong as his uh, residence. He has a house on the peak. He likes shopping here, yeah. I understand. No, 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 no. It's easy for, for him to meet his followers from Thailand. You know? <laughs> uh, people from Thailand like to come to see him. Easy, you see. They can see him shopping and have good food and things like that. Thank you for promoting <laughs> Hong Kong. <laughs> uh, he went to the extreme. It was unfortunate. He tried to win total popularity. And in fact, he had many good policies. He's a very intelligent man. Otherwise, he would, he would not be that rich. He was very, very clever man. But he wanted you know, full control or full popularity. So he introduced a number of, um, I think, populism to the extreme. I, I, I am not against populism. I'm not against welfare uh, system or welfare payment. I think for a market economy, for a capitalistic market economy, we must have a way of intervening into the market to correct some of the so-called market distortion. Otherwise, uh, it would uh, benefit the, the rich too much. And uh, there is a tendency for privatizing gains and socializing loss. You know, in our market economic system, there is always that tendency. So having a kind of welfare or interference is not bad, but what he did was that he wanted full control. So if a government or a political party does not really aim at having full control, they do not need to practice extreme populism. And if they do not practice extreme populism, um, there can be a good uh, representative government. 
And this is related to, to good governance, you know. I like uh, the book by Simon and his speech and all that. It's all about governance. Uh, so if we can really assure good governance, I do not know what kind of system for us that would assure good governance. Because you see, as you said, today, 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 now, with all the technology and things, people would like to participate. So we cannot stop them from participating. We have to allow them to participate. But how do we allow them to participate, you know, and not try to attract their so-called uh, the popularity? That would cause a lot of problems. So that is the key question, the main point. So please tell your chief minister it's okay, you know, <laughs> to, to have <laughs> some kind of populism. If he does not practice the, too much in the extreme, then he can be elected. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, okay. That uh, quotation from uh, your chief uh, administrator? Chief, chief executive. Chief executive. executive. Yes. Uh, leaves me wonder who should determine whether the, the demand for social welfare is too much or too little? Who is supposed to make this choice? He or you or me? I think we all have different views about this, our value systems. So the only way to come to the right, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the sense about whether something is too much or too little, it has to be uh, the uh, collective uh, views of the society, all the social uh, participants. Uh, so uh, you know, that's what that's the fundamental spirit of democracy. It's not an ideology. I mean, it's, it's you have your own, own opinion. I have my own opinion. So I'm going to say that you are wrong. You are going to tell me that I am wrong. But, but there is no objectivity to that. So but it, it, essentially, whether one wanted or not, whether one designed it that way or not, our opinions have to be balanced. That's the spirit of democracy. So, uh, so uh, but of course, so, and also, you know, one tends to say that if I don't like this, that's populism. Who determines that this is populism or not? If that's the societal consensus, you know, that is the correct view and judgment of the society. So for the society to arrive at a good decision, the participants, the members of society should be provided with all the relevant and objective, uh, transparent data and information and the final decision has to be uh, derived through consultations and eventually maybe voting from uh, among those, uh, those uh, uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there is no way of saying that something is wrong or bad or too much or too little. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a very fundamental uh, factor to me. Maybe because I'm too dumb, I, I don't understand if there is any other way of coming to a decision like that. Thank you. Professor Tate. Uh, uh, May I just chip in two points briefly? I think in the early history of my small country, Singapore, uh, one of the things that was both an economic tool but also a vote winner was our version of land reform to provide public housing for the mass of our population. So in this sense, the early uh, emphasis on equity created a constituency uh, that supported the PAP so strongly into the 80s. Uh, the second thing I would say is that um, I agree that we fundamentally have to decide whether we believe in the wisdom of crowds, whether we have given up on the idea of educating ourselves, our people, to really begin to trust that even if they're not professors like everyone else on stage, they fundamentally can make a rational decision given their own interests and the overall public good. Thank you. Um, Professor Tay, being a Singaporean and a think tank expert, on the ASEAN countries. Do you agree the quote of Lee Kuan Yew, which I introduced early on in my speech? I remind you, his quote is, quote, I have never believed that democracy brings progress. I know it to have brought regression. Do you agree with him? Well, uh, amazingly, there are some Singaporeans who actually disagree with Lee Kuan Yew. 40%, uh, as I said, vote against the PAP nowadays. Uh, on the way here, uh, Kun Narong Chai said, Singapore is a very orderly society. And I joked that, well, it used to be a 
not an orderly society, it's more a lee ordered society. Um, <laughs> what, what I mean is that we have had for a long time order kind of dictated down and the question of whether we can socialize the understanding of order to really build the habits of civic consciousness about the public good. This is where we are today. So in this sense, I think the word democracy is often conflated with the idea of freedom. You know, to instantly free people may not actually enter them into a natural state of democracy. I think democracy is something we work on, we fight for, we develop over time. The habits of consultation, of not, not a winner-take-all society, just because I won one vote more than you, I decide everything my way. Uh, these, uh, I think, are uh, the fundamentals of democracy. And so if Mr. Lee at that time, uh, 97, meant that simply freeing people does not make them into a better state, I would tend to agree with him. But keeping them forever locked into a rigid order will also not develop those habits of democracy and deliberation. Thank you. Any comment on Professor Tate's point? No? Well, believe it or not, uh, I've been reminded this is the time for Q&A from the floor. Yes, I believe. <laughs> uh, any questions from the floor? Okay, oh, Whoa, lots. Wow. Wonderful, wonderful. Can uh, someone give them the mic? Uh, I would take the question from the lady in green. It looks like being in India. <laughs> they have seminar in India, everyone hands up. Is that right? Uh, want, can someone hand the mic to the lady in green? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very honored attending the lecture. And I have a, an energy economy related question for Minister uh, Nalong Chai because uh, I'm from the China General Nuclear Corporation and I'm a year two student for, uh, in the Master of Economics program. So actually, um, uh, as you may know, our group signed a accord with um, EGAT. And uh, last, uh, last month, you may know, we signed MOU uh, with uh, EGAT subsidiary for uh, inviting them for nuclear um, investment in China uh, as well. So maybe it's a little uh, re irrelated with the democracy, but um, for uh, our, actually, I would like to ask them um, about uh, some uh, like renewable clean energy economy about uh, the uh, um, in Thailand, like uh, we also have been invited with um, the cooperation between the uh, between Thailand and uh, uh, in terms of the uh, electric uh, electricity supply. So actually, in terms of energy safety, um, uh, I would like to know what is um, the uh, future uh, future attitude from Thailand um, government in terms of like renewable clean energy. Um, yeah, by that chance, it's kind of a coincidence. I, I didn't, it's kind of re related with um, the uh, democratic things, but um, I, it's something related with economics because I'm a student with economics. Thank you. Uh, difficult, but I, I think I understand your question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. No, 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 <laughs> I, no, no, I will try. It's a little bit with democratic things like that. No, I, I will try. The question is about energy policy, energy development in Thailand, and uh, what is likely to happen. I would answer that in the context of our seminar. And my answer is that the last few years of trying to be democratic, trying to uh, create the so-called non-functionable representative government has caused very severe damage to our energy sector. Uh, when we talk about energy, uh, we would like to achieve energy sustainability. And that energy sustainability has three dimensions. One is security, second is economy, the third is ecology. Uh, because of populism, the previous governments have kept the price of uh, natural gas very, very, very low to the bottom. In fact, with a lot of subsidy and also have distorted uh, the price of diesel and benzene and so on. So we are risking this problem of energy security and I have been brought into this position in order to correct that. We would promote more security in energy by diversification. Of course, renewable energy being a part of that. And uh, ecology, you know, to make sure that uh, when we do gas, 
or coal, uh, we would try our best to use the most modern uh, technology. We are cooperating with uh, countries like China, like um, Japan, you know, for their technology, Indonesia, for the uh, raw material supply and others. I hope that answers your Trump question. So if not, we, we can a, talk uh, about let, it Let's outside. take a question on, uh, from this side. Oh, Professor Tate, sorry. I just about to say that the same picture is in Indonesia. The energy subsidies are draining the economy. It remains one of the true tests of the new Jokowi government, whether they will cut, cut the subsidies and do the rational or perhaps unpopular thing. Let's take a question from this side. Let's take a, 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 the gentleman on this side. Uh, yeah, in yellow shirt, I think, or pink shirt. Yeah, thank you very much for the insightful talks from uh, all the speakers. Um, actually, uh, from what uh, um, I have listened, uh, um, the first thing is that uh, the quality of the government is very important okay, uh, for uh, bringing us uh, with a better environment. And it seems like uh, when we want to consider about the economic development, uh, sometimes in, in the past, in the history of some of your countries, uh, democracy has been uh, um, a little bit like sacrifice in order to have a strong government to bring us with economic development. And uh, as from uh, Dr. Yang, you have mentioned that uh, after achieving a certain degree of economic development, uh, then people ask for democracy. And if we give them the democracy, the government may focus on some other aspect, like the social development. Um, what I want to um, express is, uh, it seems like in the past, we would like to have some kinds of economic development, but then uh, uh, there is a trade-off for democracy. And should we actually, like, we just focus on economic development and try to sacrifice democracy in the future? And uh, is it actually, I think for social development and economic development, they are both very important for the society. Uh, should we just focus on economic development instead of uh, the other aspect? Just like the people now uh, in Hong Kong, all right, now, objectively speaking, they have the whole movement asking for more democracy. Now, we never know uh, which one is the right form, okay? Which one is the right one? Okay, uh, whether we should be given more democracy or we have had enough democracy. Okay, this is an arguable uh, case. But the point is... Uh, um, what is uh, your point? What yeah, is your question? Yeah, I, I'm trying to figure out. Okay, now, um, and then if a strong government is very important for the economic development, and if the mass trying to question whether the current government is really the suitable one, should we move forward and try to listen to the people to see if there is uh, any room for change and give them more rights in voicing out their concern and give the people more democracy instead of just focusing on the economic development uh, of a region or a country? Yeah. Who would like to take the question? Dr. Yang? Yes, actually uh, you uh, give me the opportunity for me to say something that I wanted to say, <laughs> although that may or may not be a direct answer to your point, which is that uh, as, we, as one might focus on economic uh, development, that economic development, say, you know, economic growth, could come at the expense of social equities. This is actually what is happening right now in the context of rapid globalization and rapid technological change. Uh, the, uh, many people, many classes of people, and many economies uh, are growing more rapidly as a whole in the aggregate terms as a result, but that is now coming at the expense of so social e equalities. In other words, social inequalities have been rising very uh, rapidly in every country or every economy around the world uh, because these globalization and technological changes favor those who have more knowledge, who are more uh, in command of inter information technology and so on, whereas uh, many other people do not have such capacities and therefore uh, the, the income gap grows uh, between uh, people and that's the rising inequalities and lessening of social quality. 
uh, social uh, uh, development. Uh, and then also, a promotion of economic growth can come at the expense of environment, the destruction of environment, uh, too much uh, use of uh, uh, dirty uh, energies, for example, and that uh, pollutes the air and that pollutes the climate system and so on. My point is that we, there are, we can think of three pillars among which there can be conflicts or uh, supportive relationship. E economic, environment, and, 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 and social. And uh, each society and, and the, this co inter uh, global community as a whole has to make efforts to balance the three. And more ideally, try to find ways of seeking, finding, and max in increasing synergies among those three dimensions of uh, uh, economy. And when you balance them properly, that would mean the sustainability of all economic, social, and environmental uh, progress. But if there is an imbalance, then that doesn't go very far. The system will break down. So actually, I'm talking about what is referred to in the literature as sustainable development. So in the case of Hong Kong, for example, if you want to determine whether you are having too much social welfare or not, you'll have to consider, put that question issue in the context of the consideration of these three dimensions of the society and development and try to determine. And this, of course, determination has to come through a consultative process among the citizens, residents of Hong Kong, whether you are having the right balance or you are having an imbalance. And you want to have the right balance in order to promote sustainability of your society. So, uh, so, so, you know, otherwise, without, you know, putting the issue in the context of sustainable, sustainability considerations, you cannot really say that you are having too much progress uh, growth or too little progress, you are having too much social welfare or too little. I think that has to be the, the, the decision within that framework. I'm not sure if I have answered your question, but I made my point. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, Professor Ju would like to make uh, some yeah, comments. I just want to uh, add uh, two points. One is that um, democracy in uh, a lot of different society, they become desirable uh, because the kind of political good it can bring to society in and by itself. So you don't need to justify the adoption of democratic system you know, on the basis of whether it promised uh, economic prosperity. Uh, I, I, I simply want to delink you know, that mechanical relationship. You know, it may or may not. However, it might be desirable. You know, be, you know, it might provide better protection for freedom. It gives voice to you know, ordinary citizens. It tried to uh, implement the, uh, the principle of equality. And secondly, I think that democracy might be necessary, not, if, not just desirable for some society, if that become uh, the only legitimate way to sustain the public authority. Okay, if society comes to, to a point, you know, without introducing democratic system, then particular society may not become governable at all. You know, the, the, you, know you cannot really uh, uh, com uh, you know, demand citizens' allegiance uh, to uh, the, the country, and they and cannot expect the public authority will have enough uh, 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 credibility, you know, to perform its proper function. In that case, I think, you know, these society, you know, probably they reach to a certain stage, you know, democratic transition might be uh, either necessary or desirable, yeah. Let's uh, take two more questions. Uh, I see a lot of hands uh, on this side, so can we give the mic to this lady sitting here on this side? Yeah. We, we try to be fair. Thank you, you honorary speakers. And I have a question to ask Professor Chu. Uh, you have just compared India with China. So I'm interested in how would you compare Taiwan with mainland China in terms of the relationship between democracy and economic development? Thank you. Very good question, Professor Chu. Over yeah. to you. <laughs> Uh, it, it's a very astute uh, question, uh, the kind of question I expect out of uh, Hong Kong U. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Um, obviously, the two society, um, in many ways, you know, there are strong cultural affinity between the two. However, they do travel down from very different trajectory. Uh, so it's difficult to really to direct, you know, make, I would say, a uh, systematic comparison. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, every time I travel to China, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I was always confronted with the question, you know, the, whether China will follow the full step of Taiwan. Uh, uh, people, the reason why that, you know, Taiwan exemplify uh, a, a case where you can, the, you know, a one-party authoritarian regime uh, can um, uh, carve out uh, a non-violent, you know, uh, uh, least disrupt disruptive path to a democratic system. Um, and actually, the incumbent elite uh, uh, can uh, take advantage, you know, of the fact that they have delivered successful economic prosperity, uh, and their past record may not be entirely a liability, you know. So they might, uh, you know, reinvent itself, you know, like the KMT uh, in a new competitive environment. Um, however, I often yes, so. On this score, I would say Taiwan does, you know, offer, uh, you know, a case uh, uh, that, you know, is very relevant, you know, to, to China uh, situation. But same time, um, over time, you know, I worry that uh, Taiwan also offer uh, some negative heuristic, you know, not always positive, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, our current situation. We have very severe uh, political gridlock, uh, and and we also the, the, the have the problem of the uh, political polarization, um, and, and also our economy. I have to say, you know, has been slackened, you know, considerably, uh, especially after the historical power rotation in year 2000. Um, so whether you know the art example will make you know our story more convincing, more appealing. Uh, to uh, the intellectual and the uh, uh, citizen in China. I don't know. I, I mean, it's up, you know, for them to uh, come to the, uh, the final judgment, yeah. Thank you very much. Now, I've been advised by our students that uh, time is up. However, given the interesting discussion and that we have uh, four distinguished speakers still on the stage, I'll take one more question from this side, okay? This lady sitting... Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, you know, thanks, thanks so much for sharing all the interesting experience and um, case studies um, with us this evening. So um, may I ask if you were an economic advisor or minister to the Hong Kong government, what would you advise the head of Hong Kong government to deal with the situation now? i.e. the Occupy. Thank you. Dr. Oranch, I uh, probably has most experience in this regard. Oh, oh wow. Occupy very Thailand. Very easy, very easy. <laughs> what you are having here is baby stuff. <laughs> <laughs> compare with what we had, compare with what we have had for over the last 40 years. You know, this is nothing. <laughs> it should be encouraged. You know, um, I was a, a student like that once, and I did that at that time. Uh, and I remember, you know, we had an authoritarian government. I participated in the shutdown Bangkok, you know, Occupy Bangkok. Got rid of that uh, military government. Now I'm serving military government. <laughs> <laughs> so it's... Nothing serious, you know, when you have young people having conscience, you should be happy. Uh, as long as they do not uh, do anything disorderly or violence, let them be. You know, I give advice, let them be. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll <laughs> Very good, thank you. I'll ask uh, each of the speakers to uh, share one minute view of uh, yours uh, before we 
invite Professor Chen to uh, wrap up the session. Professor Tay, would you like to start? Thank you. Um, I think that there's no really one model of what will work, both economically and politically. Uh, it's for a lot of societies to decide for themselves, given their own juncture of where they are in development terms of what the society's ethos is. And what I think is uh, sometimes invidious is to make too many comparisons, not for the idea of understanding, which is important, comparisons for understanding are important, but comparisons as in like, you know, we are superior to you, you should be heading our direction. I think those are something that I would be very cautious about. Uh, there is no cookie cutter for any solution. Uh, just as one brief background, I was also the president of the Students' Union uh, in the NUS when we were the only university in Singapore. And we actually faced a policy of Lee Kuan Yew's that we disagreed with, just to give preferences to graduate mother scheme. Uh, uh, and actually we petitioned against it and we presented a petition to the government. And after they sh shot us down, years later they changed their policy. So I do believe that people need to find different avenues to speak up for what they believe in. And it's important for youth particularly to have a sense of belief. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Uh, two points. One very short reply uh, to this question that has just been raised, which is this. The other day, just the day before yesterday, I read the uh, article contributed to the New York Times by the uh, your umbrella uh, campaign uh, leader, uh, young man, I, I understand, and I thought he made immense sense in that article. And I think the administrators, the politicians, I think should make effort to talk to the students and have a very frank uh, discussions and dialogues to understand what are the concerns which are bothering those students. Then once you get this uh, frank and uh, in-depth uh, discussions, I think you, you can find a way of, of reconciling what appears to be uh, conflicting uh, viewpoints at this moment. Now here is a longer comment, uh, which is a bit, uh, sort of, bit of a piece of information which may be of practical value to Hong Kong society. I am prompted to make this comment as I keep thinking about your concern or your administrator's concern of having too much of something, too little, or too uh, little of, of something else. And uh, so when there is, you have, you know, we have multiple objectives, multiple concerns, each, so every society it does that. And if you focus on, to concentrate on satisfying uh, some of them too much at the expense of others, then the, in the, in the medium to longer term process, uh, the, the, the system uh, breaks down. That's why I, that's the sense in which I talked about the uh, sustainability. But actually, the sustainability is right now one of the prime concerns of the United Nations. And United Nations is engaged in a process, uh, the purpose of which is to derive a minimum set of very essential elements for the sustainability of this, uh, uh, communi the, the, this uh, global community as well as each component nation in that uh, a global community. And that is referred to as, as many of you certainly know, uh, as sustainable development goals, a set of minimum but essential sustainable development goal sets. Now they're talking about 17 or some talking, some say that that's too many, let's have just 10 or 12. Now, then by uh, making efforts to uh, uh, adopt a, 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 a set of sustainable development goals in the perspective of the society, uh, then you have reached a, a way of reconciling on the uh, possibly conflicting uh, policy goals and issues. So I maybe, uh, and in, back in Korea, I have launched a two-year project to discuss and adopt what could be the essential set of sustainable development goals for Korea, considering economic, social, uh, environmental, and all that. And maybe uh, Hong Kong uh, may interest, be interested in engaging in this kind of exercise of having a discussion among all the citizens and try to come up with an agreement on a common set of sustainable development goals which the Hong Kong people would think that this society should pursue. 
then that would have addressed your concerns about not having too much social spending, not having too much focus on uh, economic growth, and, and, and so on. So I propose that you consider the possible value of undertaking this kind of exercise. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ancha? Yes, I, I should say something about what happened in Thailand now, uh, more current. Uh, you know, we had coup d'etat, the last one, 22nd of May. And from 26th of May, I have been engaged to work with the military. Tough life. <laughs> I was enjoying myself in my retirement, you know, waking up late and taking exercise, playing golf, going to all directors' meetings, getting a lot of director fees. and. Then I had to go to the military compound at 9 o'clock every morning. Every morning, you know, and quarter to nine in my car, there was a telephone call, Dr. Narong Chai, where are you? <laughs> so this is the, my life now. Now let me say this, um, although we had this coup d'etat, and we had this military related or military kind of government, the reason I joined them because I believe having been with them for several months, we still, they still you know, commit to the so-called um, representative, representative form of government, participating form of government, and freedom of expression. I think the reason that we had this coup d'etat on the 22nd of May was because the conflicts had gone on for too long and too far and too much. The damage done to the country was very, very bad to the economy and all. So therefore, this coup d'etat. And um, according to the plan that we have, they told me that they would like my service for only one year, you know, for only one year, <laughs> to help them reform the economy. So the government we have, uh, we had at the beginning after 2nd of May, I called it uh, military governing period. And from September, it has become military participating, military participating. Now I participate, they participate. About the end of next year, about the end of next year, there will be election. But after that, I will call military watching. <laughs> so, reason is because although we allow, we want to allow representation, participation, freedom of expression in a society like ours, we need to have some kind of strong body to watch over us under, of course, set rules and, and regulations how they can be allowed to watch over the next government that would come from election. This is my, my last word. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Professor Jude, uh, one minute. Um, I would like to offer uh, my Hong Kong uh, colleagues and uh, fellow students um, advice uh, based on uh, our own experience, you know, dealing with um, student movement, um, conflict, you know, over some very emotional issue facing the country. Um, my advice would be that don't let the politics of polarization to destroy everything. It might, you know, it run a mark. It might destroy the social trust. It might destroy the common ground, the middle ground. Uh, then you won't have, you know, mainstream view. You won't have the social foundation to build up the consensus later on. Don't allow the polarization to undermine your rule of law to erode the proper function of public authority. Uh, you know, this is also some kind of uh, price you know, people have to take into consideration. Uh, but also I agree with a lot of other advisor, uh, observer. This morning I walked over uh, um, you know, the, uh, the umbrella MRT. movement uh, MRT, uh, over yeah. the uh, skyway. Uh, yeah, I think this is a very peaceful, you know, and the students, um, you know, they well-organized, they know what they are doing. Uh, so it's amazing, okay. 
Um, but I do hope that this episode, you know, will lead to something constructive and positive in the long run. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Professor Ba, Dr. Naran Chai, Professor Chu, Professor Tay, and Dr. Yang for your lively discussions about the Asian experiences of democracy and economic development. To conclude the lecture tonight, may I invite Professor Edward Chen to deliver his closing remarks. Professor Chen, please. This is rather late. Um, I'm happy to see that so many of you are here. And some of you may be here consecutively for the eighth year. So thank you very much you know, for your coming to this lecture series. And thank you very much to my distinguished uh, speakers, my old friends here. It's more, almost impossible for me to summarize in a few minutes. The discussion was so rich. But let me just uh, use a few minutes to tell you what I have got from the whole discussion. Uh, I have two messages and one observation. The first message is the relationship between economic development and democracy is certainly complex. But it seems there's some consensus, at least from Asian experience. Economic development starts first before democracy. It's what we call the developmental hard state, meaning a government which is rather authoritarian but effective and with development of the economy in mind. This kind of hard state, what we call developmental hard state, happened, I think, from the panel speakers in Hong Kong under the rather, you know, uh, in a sense, non-democratic British government in the 60s and 50s. In Taiwan, under one party, KMT. And even in Thailand, it's during your general Prem's times, 1980 to 88, is also authoritarian. Korea is under your President Park, and President Chung is also authoritarian, but very development-oriented. In Singapore, of course, also under the leadership of Lee Kuan Yew. So it seems we can come to some consensus that in Asia, at least, economic development starts with some kind of developmental state. So there are good autocracy and also bad autocracies. A bad autocracy examples would be the Philippines under Marcos, China under the Gang of Four. Now the second message is, after economic development under some kind of authoritarian government, like it or not, it will give rise to democracy. They will demand for and realization of democracy in the countries. But again, the message is there are good democracies and also not so good democracies. You know, good democracies meaning it's effective government. And all the words we have heard, good governance, quality government. So if democracy without good governance, without quality government, still it doesn't work. In what I have got from the speakers, this transition of democracy could be long, could be for many years, like in Thailand, to some extent even in Taiwan. But democracy can become stabilized very soon, like in South Korea, I think. After 1987, more or less democracy is taking in its stabilized form and even fighting against the Asian financial crisis and now leading South Korea to be a well-developed economy in many aspects. So these are the two messages. You know, you have good and bad democracy, uh, good and bad autocracy. But my final observation is with reference to Hong Kong. If you look at what our distinguished speakers have said, then Hong Kong under British rule, how would you characterize it? It's not so democratic, but quality government, you know, good governance. And what do we say about the SAR government now we have? It's much more democracy. It's almost 100% you know, elected seats in LegCo. You can say 20% functional constituencies are indirectly elected. It's much more, it's quite democratic by all standards. But we don't have a quality government. 
we don't have good governance. So it's just the reverse of the pre-1997 times. Now why? Why today, again, the observation I can make out of it is, today's lack of quality government, government or good governance is to some extent not, or to a large extent, not because we are not ready, not because we don't have the administrative capability, not because of the level of education attainment, not because our per capita income level, but because of certain pitfalls built into our political institution. I do believe that democracy without a genuine political party system with alternating governments, party rule would work. So today, you do not see long-term policies being formulated in Hong Kong, and you don't see the talents being attracted to political parties, and you don't see constructive opposition in LegCo. So I would, I would think, you know, all the speakers gave us very good lessons, you know, to think about Hong Kong. And I'm sure for the young people now, uh, in the, in the street, they should fight for, of course, one man, one vote. They should fight for civil nomination. But don't forget, that's not all. The most important thing is the underlying political institution in Hong Kong. Without alternating government politics, democracy may not work. So I, while I you know, praise all the enthusiasm of the students, but perhaps they have to think deeper into our problem. So thank you very much once again for my friends and distinguished speakers. Thank you, Professor Chen, and please remain on stage and take a group photo with all our guests.